And let me start, please, by expressing my thanks for the invitation extended to me to be here. It's really an honor to be at a conference where pretty much all of the most uh, significant authors in the area of ayahuasca are here. So uh, I'm really honored and, and somewhat daunted to be presenting among them. But uh, I want to present a piece of my dissertation today, talk a little bit about some of the ideas in there. Uh, and the starting point is the observation that accounts of the Brazilian ayahuasca religions usually describe these groups. And I'm talking about the Union do Vegetal and Santo Daime as the two most prominent, as somehow combining folk Catholicism, indigenous shamanism, and European spiritism. In Santo Daime practice, folk Catholicism is everywhere evident from the use of Christian prayers to the constant invocation of Catholic divine persons, Jesus Christ the Redeemer, the Ever-Virgin Mary, and the Divine Eternal Father. Likewise with shamanism, whose contribution of the substance ayahuasca is what seems to attract the most contemporary attention. But what about spiritism? What do daimistas think and say about this aspect of their practice? It's relatively well known that spirit mediumship is accepted in many of what we might call expansionist groups of daimistas, but not so much in the traditionalist groups in Akri. There's a basic lack of information on this point, which might lead some to assume that esotericism played a minor role in the development of the urban use of ayahuasca, perhaps even having been added by New Agers from the 1970s onward, but this would be incorrect. In this paper, I'm going to focus on Alto Santo, the first Daimista center, which was founded in the 1940s in the capital city of Acre State, Rio Branco, and where we did field work on several trips, as you heard, between 2002 and 2007. And I want to suggest that esotericism was central to the development of Santo Daime while addressing these questions. At what point and under what circumstances did esotericism enter this picture? What part did it play in the formation of Daimista practice within Akarian society? And how does esoteric thought inform Daimista understanding of, of health, uh, of illness, and ayahuasca, the relation between them? My contention is going to be that by looking at the role of esotericism in Santa Daime history, we can understand Daimista ritual practice as a means of easing attention in Brazilian culture between individual autonomy and hierarchical holism. Okay, the current brings the healing, Daimista theories of health and healing. There's two primary kinds of ritual in which ayahuasca is used at Alto Santo. Inarios or hymnals, uh, also called bailados, because they involve dance and concentration, silent seated meditation. At the outset of the second kind of ritual, Daimistas are read the decree, which is essentially a series of moral precepts and delivered as such instructions for parents, general orientations for those seeking to learn from what it calls this school of divine wisdom. And among the decrees instructions is this. Upon receiving the Santo Daimi, everyone should consider themselves within the current and not permitted to go outside for conversation. The word translated here as current is corrente, which has many of the same meanings as its English cognate, it's named in the decree as an agent acting through the ayahuasca or daime, which, having been ingested by those present, joins them all in mysterious union, or at least ought to join them all, because the use of the imperative should implies a moral obligation and the possibility of ignoring it. The sense of current is energy moving through a medium seems most appropriate to the daimista usage since it recalls mesmeric ideas of a fluid plenum throughout the universe flowing, as one 19th century writer put it, through one body by the currents which issue therefrom to another, as in a magnet, which produces that phenomenon which we call animal as opposed to mineral magnetism. The concept of a current joining the ayahuasca drinkers in daimi rituals thus makes use of a parascientific language shared with hydraulics and wave theory and applies the jargon of a Tesla or a mesmer to experience of the indigenous drink ayahuasca. Alongside it, too, we find in Daimisa talk other notions with related esoteric roots. The term afluido, for example, which refers to the experience of ayahuasca's dwindling effects at the conclusion of a ritual, posits ayahuasca as working on those same fluids behind animal magnetism. 
Likewise, ayahuasca, daime, and especially the jagubi vine component of it are said to bring a mysterious yet basic force, forza, that is characterized in the hymns as being universally present and accessible to all but often ignored, even condemned as diabolical. Okay. With this esoteric vocabulary express, emphasizing connection and energetic encounter, Alto Santo Discourse points to the belief that the sacred coordination of collective intentionality is critical to gaining divine favor and especially health. Simultaneously, it implies the inverse proposition, namely that profane bickering and dissension earn disfavor and breed illness. This in turn suggests a dimista theory of health and illness, the idea that ordinary social relations tend to create discord and then sickness, and that the performance of hymnal rituals reverses these ill effects through the displacement of human willfulness by divine order, and especially through the use of the voice, but I don't have time to get into that here. Looking more closely at Dimista discourse about morality and illness, however, we can see the issue is framed not in terms of local social relations, but universal moral laws written, as it were, into the fabric of the cosmos. This might be called karmic morality for its resemblance to Eastern ideas of karma, as well as the presumed influence of exponents of esotericism on its formation of figures such as Swami Vivekananda and Madame Blavatsky. Daimistas at Alto Santo illustrate this view of the moral causes of illness with stories in which the source of suffering is traced to an act of ill will and hence disobedience to moral law and insult to cosmic order. In one such narrative, an early follower of Ireneo Serra, the founder, sought to discover through di drinking daimi why he was afflicted with a congenital malady of the leg that would not be healed despite his assiduous spiritual work. In a vision, the man, who was an Afro-Brazilian gentleman, saw a colonial-era sugar mill where a white master cruelly whipped the slaves that were turning the mill. Realizing that he had previously been incarnated as that master, the man understood that his crippled leg was divine punishment for moral transgression, whose magnitude meant that it couldn't be expunged in a single lifetime. Daimi heals all, except for divine sentences, as Daimistas say. Another story tells of Ireneo Serra's adopted son, Paulo, who was once asked to ride to town and pick up a sack of grain. Grumbling, Paulo carelessly flicked the, the uh, horse with a switch and injured its eye. On the way back from town, riding through the forest where branches hung down low, one struck him in the eye in the exact spot on his body that he had hurt the horse. He arrived home only to find that Ireneo Serra already knew all about it and explained to Paulo that his eye would only heal when the horses did. Such stories reveal an iron law of karma. Acts of ill will will return to their originators, who must feel on their own skin the suffering they've caused others. Thus, within ritual, Daimista seek to discover those moral transgressions that have caused them suffering, to confront this reality and ask divine forgiveness for doing wrong. We thus have Daimistas drinking an indigenous drink, praying to a Christian god, and framing the experience in esoteric terms. Where did this esotericist influence come from, and why did it gain traction among the rubber tappers who gathered around Irineo Seja? Colonization in the jungle, uh, uh, Avaki, order and progress in the implantation of civilization in the jungle. Esotericism was widespread in Brazil in the first decades of the 20th century and was especially pervasive amongst military officers who often picked it up with their training at the National Army Academy in Rio and carried it into the interior as part of their work of integrating the nation and bringing civilization to the backlands. While at least nominally Catholic, many officers were also Rosicrucians or Freemasons as well as adherents of Comte's religious positivism. Among the avatars of religious positivism in Brazil, none is more revered than Cândido Mariano da Silva Rondon. A poor child of part Indian descent, Rondon found his way to the National Military Academy in Rio, which served as launching pad for his career as explorer, army officer, and founder of Brazil's first Indian agency. Perhaps most famously, in the two decades straddling the turn of the 20th century, Rondon led teams of explorers through Brazil's backlands, laying down telegraph wire across hundreds of miles of wilderness in a Herculean attempt at, as historian Todd Diacon put it, stringing together a nation. 
Hondon's work in the backlands reflected his commitment to religious positivism as much as his nationalist fervor. This double purpose can be seen in photographs he had taken of Indian people literally wrapped in the Brazilian flag, making sure that the positivist motto, order and progress, was uh, visible in the, in the photograph as a visual argument for positivism's role in bringing them into the national fold. What was under construction in the interior, Diakon writes, was as much a positivist message as a nationalist one. The Catholic Church fiercely opposed esoteric groups, yet they evidently held ideological appeal to men, mostly men, engaged in the conquest of the Brazilian interior. Across the great cultural divide between European-descended Brazilians and forest Indians, religious positivism promised to build a bridge. The supposed capacity to change wild outsiders into citizens of the nation represented an extension of positivism's primary mission, in Diakon's words, to complete the pact between social classes so that one unified humanity could unite all people on earth. Now this noble goal existed in a certain tension with positivism's fundamental tenet, the notion of a natural social order. It may appear problematic to hope to diminish social friction while assuming that inequality is the result of a natural and even God-given order. But part of the appeal of positivism, it appears to me, was its fit with a contradiction in Brazilian culture that results in anthropologist Roberto D'Amata's words from the curious and often perverse combination of an imported individualist civic egalitarianism with a personalistic and hierarchical form of social organization. This amalgam of holism and individualism, of equality and hierarchy, results inevitably in caudillismo, authoritarianism, in the various personalisms performing the role of the uninvited guests of democracy in Brazil's social landscape. To oversimplify, organization on the plantation house model meant an outsized role in practical social relations for the personalistic sphere with its hierarchical forms. With enlightenment values of impersonal citizenship and individual autonomy seemingly tacked on in later attempts at modernization. Damata sees as one result of this a tension between Brazilian culture's tendency to create social groupings around authoritarian big men and its fervent embrace of democratic ideals. Hondon, a consummate big man, despite his tiny physical stature, carried this contradiction into the field, helping set the tone for colonization of Brazil's interior in the early 20th century and inspiring many to follow his example of connecting the benighted peoples of the backlands to the Brazilian nation and through it to the dynamo of world civilization. In Acre's rubber industry, there were similarly men who specialized in mediating contact with the natives in furtherance of the goals of civilization, or at least of capitalism. Known as Indian tamers, or in a nod to their ostensible concern for the indigenous soul, Indian catechizers, these men were glorified in standard historiography as pioneers, while revisionists revealed some of them to be little more than hired killers. More recent nuanced portraits of their perspectives and motivations show that for at least some of these men, esoteric knowledge was central to their work in bringing the Indians into the nation and civilization. For example, the Acrian catechizer Felizardo Cerqueira, a contemporary of Hondon whose fame was merely regional, explicitly credited his success at taming Indian groups to his study of the male order materials of the esoteric circle of the communion of thought, or CECP. This organization taught such new thought principles as the determinative power of thought and the spiritual communication of analogous mentalities, he's in quotes, of similar intent. In a text he wrote about 1950 to secure a government pension as a pioneer of Acri, Felizardo proclaimed this. I, with the help of the study of esotericism, was able to discover in myself a force that is vulgarly called magnetism. This force has come since I was a child, but I completely ignored it. In many cases, I, not understanding it, gave it the very vulgar name that all of humanity, or almost all, applies this great divine virtue, devil. When this force is nothing, if not the true God, vibration to aid humanity itself. That Felizardo found the CECP teachings so useful in his work with Indians is all the more intriguing when we consider that his experiences, including drinking ayahuasca with them, 
and that the very same group, the CECP, played an important role in Ireneo Serra's career uh, as the founder of Santa Daime, the master's house. In this context of Acre and colonization as a broad mission of implanting civilization in the jungle, Ireneo Serra's career as a spiritual leader takes on larger outlines, and his work becomes legible as part of the same processes that brought the Indians into the nation except that its focus was the domestication not of Indian persons, but of the indigenous forest powers accessed through ayahuasca. Indeed, today he's celebrated as uh, one founder of Acre's unique culture. Ayahuasca use was not uncommon in the rubber camps in the forest, but Ireneo Seja's work with it was distinguished by this act of domestication. He attached his name to it, brought it into his house, rebaptized it daime, and made it the basis for his reputation around town. So complete was the identification of Alto Santo with the drink that the congregation was known as the people of Daimi, and Ireneo Seja himself was sometimes called the father of Daimi, of ayahuasca. Sorry. This interesting phrase points to the way that Ireneo Seja was credited or blamed for bringing ayahuasca from the wild forest to the peri-urban environment, but it also signaled the fact that the social formation that arose around his work as healer, community leader, and arbiter of disputes was built on the idiom of kinship. It was more precisely founded on the institution of the Brazilian casa, or house. Daimistas at Alto Santo never talk of joining the center or being converted. Instead, they speak of arriving in the master's house. The fact that Alto Santo takes this form is significant when we consider the general importance of the house in Brazilian culture. Uh, Roberto da Mata argues that the house to this day is the primary institution involved in the creation of Brazilian personhood. Given Brazil's tumultuous history of changing governments, constitutions, and currencies, he writes, it is still the only permanent trustworthy source of social identity in Brazilian culture. Naturally, any house needs a qualified householder, so stories told at Alto Santo about Ireneo Seja's life history tend to follow a pattern that suggests his fitness to be just the kind of moral leader who gathers and keeps people around him, a big man. They depict the transformative journey of a rebellious youth from Maranhão State who, traveling to the forests of the Amazon, found a divinely ordained mission that changed his whole life making him, as one version has it, a true man in the dominion of the forest. The stories about his life trajectory emphasize the military service that he gave to a degree I found surprising initially. They suggested a kind of a double initiation in which his work for the commission charged with surveying the border between Brazil and Peru uh, led to his contact with the mysteries of the forest, including ayahuasca. And joining nationalism then and spiritual vocation, these narratives set him up as a figure powerfully connected to forest spirit forces by virtue of his work with ayahuasca, as well as to the civic powers of the city embodied in men like Guilmar dos Santos, the mid-20th century governor and senator of Acre, whose friendship with Ireneo Seja, one big man to another, is the subject of many biographical tales. These connections to power, in turn, are what enable Ireneo Seja to minister to his people. So, I want to skip a little bit of this part where I talk about the importance of the military to the, the, the classes of folks who were coming to uh, Alto Santo uh, and just pick up where uh, I quote one, a woman who lived with Edeneo Seja for a long time says, uh, through his military service, he learned a little of the regulations in order to maintain his sect. Apparently, these people looked into the military and saw that Comtean uh, social pact coming to fruition and liked it. Okay. While it's not certain when or how Ireneo Seja gained exposure to esoteric philosophy, it may have been through this military service or uh, perhaps as a member of the Circle of Regeneration and Faith. This group was the first urban ayahuasca using group in Acre. Uh, and he was a member in the 1910s. Its name reminds one of the CECP with its emphasis on circle and uh, suggests that uh, maybe it was uh, also uh, taking that same lead. Other evidence uh, suggests that esotericism was important during this formational period. Terms like astral, the visionary space or the space in which the, the etheric body moves, let's say, appear in hymns of early followers from the 1940s. 
And uh, likewise, there's membership certificates in the archives at Alto Santo that support the notion of a mass affiliation in the 1960s. But Ireneo Seja's own membership number is considerably earlier in the sequence, suggesting that he joined at least several years earlier. So in conclusion, I just want to offer a couple of ideas about this whole scene I've tried to lay out. The CECP was like other esoteric groups in that it sought to establish a communion of like-minded souls whose uh, geographically dispersed collective efforts could somehow join together and bring positive effects in the lives of practitioners and benefits to humanity more broadly. Uh, there's this, I have a quote that I'll skip supporting that from their key text, but actually I can't really skip. Let me just read a little bit of this. When you emit your thoughts with the intention to do good to other men, they will join together with some mental current of analogous nature, the same word, corrente, and mix themselves with it. And they augment this current, which constitutes a single mass proportional to the number of mentalities that emitted their thoughts with identical intention. You see this parascientific language. In this manner, you contribute to the production of an invisible yet true mental force, which constitutes a positive link of union and communion amongst yourselves and beings of a mentality analogous to yours. And there's a puzzle in this for me because it implies nearly the opposite of personhood as that hierarchical house model under which Ireneo Sejo is likened to a shady tree extending over his people. I want to suggest that this way of phrasing the matter asserts the value of individual autonomy, like a number of monads emitting waves that interact with each other, a good enlightenment vision of society abstracted into currents and fluids. Yet this all takes place under the aegis of the master's house with its relational hierarchical way of generating persons. If Damata is right about the tension between Brazil's hierarchical social forms and its individualist civic ideals, we should expect to find it in Daimista practice as much as elsewhere. In this light, there's a special role for ayahuasca as an exogenous element taken in both at the cultural and individual level. The fact of its origins in the wild forest may be important because it thus represents a force which, coming from outside Brazilian civilization, might therefore prove efficacious in addressing tensions within it. Might it not be that Daimista practice performs with, its, with respect to indigenousness the same work as Comtean positivism, but on a spiritual rather than sociological level? Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. We have time for one short question. My question kind of relates to the last thing you just said. Um, there's concerns um, about the appropriation of ayahuasca indigenous traditions by you know, the Western contemporary culture. Um, Irenaeo, in a way, represents a transitional figure between the, um, let's say, the colonizers and the forest traditions, and he himself is a black man. I'm not sure exactly how to phrase that question, but I think you do. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'll see if I can go with that. Uh, the key idea there is Ireneo Seja as a transitional figure. And certainly what you see happening in these stories that I made reference to is a lot of focus on the spatial movement of ayahuasca from wildness into civilization and uh, from, from the forest into the city. And so that certainly does lend itself to that interpretation that, well, once it's in the city, it can go anywhere, right? Uh, these people that I uh, studied with don't see it that way um, uh, for various reasons that I probably shouldn't really get into. But um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of support for that, that idea in the notion that what he was doing was taking ayahuasca from a wild space, domesticating it, and Christianizing it. One hymn says, the caboclos, the Indians, are arriving with naked arms and feet on the ground. They bring good medicines to cure the Christians. So I think that you can read into that exactly what you're putting out there. Thank you. Thank you very much.